you, sir. Dr. Shinde was my teacher and ever grateful because he introduced me to diabetes. Yeah. Okay, Nita, thank you. So I'm going to talk about a story, less of science, and it's also my autobiography. And uh, basically it's driven by Pablo Coelho's famous alchemist book sort of central theme that world conspires to help you. I'm not going to tell you much about that, but I have written this in some other book, in the Confessions of a Thin Fat Indian, which I published about five years ago in European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And again, like say many times, it's magic rather than logic, which actually tells you some things. And therefore, it's important not to actually ignore the thoughts which you get, which may be quite anti-establishment, quite anti-challenging, and that actually leads you to number of new discoveries. So what is this thin fat phenotype? It's a comparative body composition of Indians with respect to Europeans, and I think people forget this. My original observations were all comparative, and still the phenotype is comparative. So that for a given weight or BMI, Indians have lower lean and higher fat percent and higher risk of diabetes. Starting as a diabetologist and starting to investigate why Indians have so much diabetes in 1980, that's what actually was the first major thing which I found. And this was found in BJ Medical College very much in this town, which is my alma mater. And this Bija Medical College and this Sassoon Hospital are, of course, very famous institutes. And uh, in 1976, when I became registrar to the professor of medicine, I was appointed in the diabetes clinic. And they had this height stadiometer and they had a weighing scale. That time, it was measuring height in inches and weight in pounds. And we had to calculate BMI, which I had read in the textbooks, and it was in kg per meter square. I couldn't afford a calculator, so I used to do it with the lock table. And first 10 patients in the clinic, and actually things were so different from what was described in the textbooks that I realized we need to do something about this. Then I went to Oxford for my training after my MD. That's Radcliffe Infirmary and my colleagues. I trained there for three years. And one of the most revealing thing was being a volunteer in various research studies. So with David Matthews doing his HOMA and John Oscar doing his SIGMA, I was a unsuspecting volunteer in both. I had six radioactive infusions to measure my glucose turnovers, etc. The most important finding was when the laboratory came back with the results. This green is Edwin Gale, very famous diabetologist. And the red one is me. Edwin was about 30 kilograms heavier than I was that and he had a body mass index of 26, I had a body mass index of 20. Despite that, I had higher glucose after drinking glucose, but much more importantly, I had very high insulin concentrations. So much so that laboratory came back and told me that you had mislabeled the samples, because they thought body mass index would be proportional. Actually took one month off from Oxford, came to Pune to take my father back. But that time I went to again BJ Medical College and said, I'll measure about 150, 200 patients in the college OPD and compare it with the diabetes clinic in Oxford. And this is something which I put together that time. It was published much later. Our patients were diagnosed at least 10 years younger. 
they had a body mass index which was at least five units smaller. Their midarm circumference was 20% lower. But despite this, their waist hip ratio was 5% higher, which is quite substantial. Subscapular to triceps skin fold ratio was higher. And these two things I have added later, when I got a proper DEXA machine to measure fat, we showed that for each kg or body mass index, Indians had almost 30% higher fat. And this reflected that time I could find out in insulin resistance. And again, there might be some students in the audience, a measuring tape and skin fold calipers gave us all the information. So it's important to learn that actually simple measures can give you a lot of information. And I have fought against BMI for the last 40 years. I was quite happy that Dr. Makkar told about ABCD. I didn't know about it. That's been my fight that obesity and adiposity are different. And that's been actually all coming out of this. And you need a skin caliper just to make, otherwise you can pinch the back below the subscapula and you know what the central obesity is. Then the first paper I published after I came back from India and started investigating was that body mass index and waist hip ratio interacted in a very unusual way that highest glucose was observed both in the men and the women in those who had low BMI but highest waist hip ratio. So it was the first story of thin centrally fat or centrally adipose individuals which had the highest glucose concentrations. Published way back in 1991, much before anyone was talking of central obesity in India. And then came a series of papers which actually supported these ideas with some imaging techniques, partly driven by our findings of simple measurements. So Harold Lebowitz and Marianne Banerjee published about 22 cases from the Bronx Hospital, the Indians within the hospital, with whole body MRI, 22 sections, and showed that Asian Indians, that means Indians, had higher body fat percent for each BMI compared to the African American in that department. This was published in 1997, I think. And then Mabel Yap and her husband Paul Durenberg working on three populations in Singapore showed same thing, that different Asian populations had higher fat percent for a given BMI compared to the white Caucasians. Then WHO invited this expert committee, and there were three Indians on this, uh, Srinath Reddy, Anura Kurpad, and myself. This was in Singapore in 2004, and I dare say it was driven by our research. What we said was that actually giving different BMI cut points for different populations would cause confusion. And therefore, internationally, we should have standard cut points but what we would advise is potential public health action points for different populations have to be different. And that is for individual countries to decide. I really pushed for measuring body fat, but that time they thought it would be too much to introduce into clinical practice. Otherwise, it was very difficult to sell this story of thin fat. And at that meeting, when I said that I have a picture which actually says these six pages of very erudite science in just one picture, the secretary of the consultation, who was a Japanese girl, said that scientific papers cannot have pictures. Today we have infographic abstracts. So I actually got quite pissed off. And I approached the editor of The Lancet to say, I have a picture, and John Yutkin knew the editor, which explains that paper which was going to appear in Lancet. And this was a picture which actually is my only claim to fame, 
it was a study called crisis even anup came as a consultant to that study once to pune and what we had done was we said we were measuring body fat by five different techniques in our people and we said that the investigators must undergo same investigations which we expect the participants to undergo and that was a real surprise i'd never suspected that i would have identical bmi to john yutkin 22.3 and when we went on the dexa machine which cost us 40000 pounds therefore i call this picture as a 40000 pound picture we realized john yutkin's body fat percent was 9% and my body fat percent in 1999 was 21% so i had twice the amount of body fat as an englishman for a similar bmi and therefore our conclusion was this image is a useful reminder of the limitations of bmi as a measure of adiposity across populations and that's where it rests it is one of the most frequently shown picture in various meetings then we will say ki when does it all originate we have discussed this twice or thrice today and i was understanding that time because that was a very limited understanding we were told as medical students that everything is more or less genetic so in a way everything can be related to some genetics because that's how the phenotype develops but it's important that genes work differently even though they have same sequence and that's what we call epigenetics and this is a very famous picture from two vet veterinary scientists from Scotland Walter and Hammond which actually mated a yorkshire horse with a shetland pony and this picture is actually father and daughter the daughter's phenotype at birth is driven by maternal phenotype very little by father's except for length and that was the actually revealing picture and the importance of intrauterine factors being important measurements for the offspring phenotype genetics as we know nowadays it's possible to do high throughput but for majority of polygenic disorders which is what we usually investigate not more than 10 to 15% of variance can be explained even by measuring across the genome what we call gvas last year we published a paper out of a consortium in eu grant called gifts where we looked at the birth weight gene risk factor between europeans and indians indians from different populations within india migrants in uk bangladeshis and bangladeshis in this was compared with a english cohort and these blue dots are the cohort from exeter where i actually have a visiting chair with andrew atley and all these dots other colored are indians for each gene risk score indians have lower birth weight and that's a very important learning from this paper that even though you have the genetics it's the environment which contributes to large part of the variance of that phenotype and that paper is in journal called diabetes of the american diabetic association this is for me one of the winning findings from that study then of course came david barker in my life in february 1991 when he came to pune and visited me because he had heard of my malnutrition related diabetes ideas he also told me about dutch winter hunger which is a very fantastic story students should read it that was a period of severe food restriction in western holland towards the end of the second world war and children who were in utero that time were again studied at the army conscription and showed varying levels of obesity depending on exposure to undernutrition in utero same time pima indian studies were driving the idea that diabetes and obesity drive the diabetes in the population 
and that was called fuel mediated teratogenesis by Norbert Frankel. And David Barker published his paper in BMJ in 1991, where actually he showed lower birth weight to be a risk factor for diabetes in later life. And I remember I told David in the first meeting that you connected the ground floor of Sasun Hospital with the fourth floor. Ground floor was the diabetes unit and fourth floor was the labor room. And the two were connected by an outsider because we could never actually imagine that. And then came the concept of fetal programming. It's a complex issue. I'm not going to go into details of it, but this is what actually is at the center of epigenetic programming. And it determines the blueprint of the organism while it is growing in the mother's womb. And therefore, all the molecules, the cells, the tissues, organ systems are programmed. And that lasts with you for the rest of the life. That is the most important window, not in 45 year and 55 year where we do the diabetes prevention trials. So thin fat phenotype is actually an example of thrifty phenotype, which was David Barker's theory. Again, I have no hesitation in saying, I suggested this term to him in 1991. And it's a case of structural teratogenesis if we look at Norbert Frankel's ideas. And then I set up with David Barker's guidance, Pune Maternal Nutrition Study in 1993. And it has now entered 25 years of serial follow-ups. We have rich data, I'm not going into details of this, but it's one of the best followed cohorts in the world with more than 95% follow-up. And we have rich biobank, which we have generated for last 30 years. And what we knew was mothers were 42 kg and with a body mass index of 18.1, and babies were 2.7 kg with 70% SGA. Lot of undernutrition in the mothers, and GDM as defined that time was almost non-existent. And B12 deficiency was there in two out of three women. And because of my ideas and measurements, I knew what to do. So we did detailed measurements of baby at birth. And this figure is a standard deviation figure where zero is an English baby, which was 800 grams heavier than the 2.7 kg babies. And all the measurements in the Indian mothers and the Indian babies were smaller than the Western babies. But there is a hierarchy. And the best measurement in Indian babies nearest to the English babies was subscapular skin fold. Triceps was lower. And in the cord blood, we found that Indian babies had higher leptin, lower adiponectin, and higher insulin concentrations. People didn't believe this, so I had to set up a second study where we took same instruments which we had measured in Pune, to London, same two observers who had done it in Pune, again in London, in John Udkin's hospital. And they studied 200 deliveries in Whittington Hospital. This is what is called pair match con uh, comparison. So we selected the babies in two cohorts which had identical birth weight. And despite identical birth weight, Indian babies were shorter. They had smaller mid-arm circumference and higher skin folds. Their insulin concentrations were higher, their leptin concentrations were higher, and adiponectin concentrations were lower. And when these children became 18 year old, now we can relate their adiposity with low vitamin B, uh, D and high folate in the mother. So this is one of the best prospective studies you can have. Again, people said, what crude instruments we are using, they like black box measurements. So we have done whole body MRI at birth in Pune and in Imperial College London with Nina Modi. And amazingly, we found what we would not have suspected, 
was that all three components of the abdominal adiposity, namely visceral, superficial, and deep abdominal fat, were higher in Indian bodies despite being seven to 800 grams lighter. And then a series of papers from different places to support this, either like say from Canada, then London mother and baby study, then a study in Suriname where they were fifth generation migrant Indians, and then again from different studies in London and Bradford the born in Bradford. There are many other studies now. And they all showed that Indian babies had higher, some fat measurement, which was either called leptin concentrations of fat mass measured in the London study for a given birth weight. Recently, I mean, I was getting told everywhere that this is an Indian phenotype, and therefore it must be genetic. So I had the opportunity to investigate data from Guinea-Bissau through a colleague in Copenhagen. So Morton. Morton had this data on twins in Guinea-Bissau. And given my predilection for this, we compared the body composition of twins with singletons, because twins are relatively undernourished in utero. And what we find is that for each age, BMI was higher in singletons. Yes, both in boys and girls. But if you look at skin folds, they were higher in the twins. So in an African country who actually have a relatively muscular phenotype, twins who are relatively undernourished compared to singletons have higher fat, either for age or for a given BMI. And therefore, this now is better understood as an intrauterine undernutrition phenotype rather than an ethnic Indian thing. Does everyone agree with me? No, there is resounding resistance to this idea from South India. And many papers are published. Unfortunately, they have compared with the Western literature as mean and SD. These are meta-analyses based on group comparisons. All our studies are individual level comparisons and finally using same instruments in two places. So I'm quite comfortable that our findings, which are supported by other findings in this institute, are similar. But there is a lot of resistance also. Is there a cellular molecular basis to this? Obviously there is. One thing to remember is that human fetus in the evolution has the highest body fat percent compared to all other animals including elephant or sea lion or whatever. This small, in, uh, this small human fetus, which is usually three kg, has the high body fat percent. There must be some reason for this. And again, from Anup's group, they showed association of myostatin gene with different aspects of body composition. We have published on FTO gene and now there is additional sort of evidence about the uh, multiple Indian cohorts which I showed you from the diabetes. So clearly genetics is important but explains very small part of it. And recently Sandeep Mathur from, Jaydeep, uh, from Jaipur has been publishing very interesting papers and he's doing transcriptomic of fat tissue in central and peripheral tissues, and he has associated some of these with partial lipodystrophy gene expression. So again, things are getting understood in a better way in molecular terms. Another interesting thing is about brown fat. This was mentioned in some of the talks today. And a newborn has some amount of body fat, especially around the neck, interscapular area and along the spine. And I was also asked question in my first publication, what you are showing as subscapular, is it brown fat or white fat? We just answered saying we think it is white fat. I don't know whether it is. And this paper was published last year, it's in Lancet, it's a paper from Holland, which has measured brown fat in Indians in Holland, compared it with Caucasians. 
And very interestingly, for a higher waist-to-hip ratio, Indians have higher fat mass, which is understood for white mass by DEXA, but lower brown fat. So within the adiposity, Indians have a more detrimental form of adiposity, more VAT than VAT. And this to me is really interesting and we need to find out what are the early life determinants of this. And Nihal has been doing fantastic studies in Vellore about defining the metabolic phenotypes of thin Indians. This paper came in Diabetes Care just a few months ago where they have shown a number of interesting things about different contributions of glucose addition to the blood and glucose removal from the blood. Very good studies. So ultimately we have to understand that though genome influences the phenotype, usually it acts through the epigenome, which is determined by the environment. And this environmental regulation is very important in differentiation, development, and growth in utero. And the term epigenetics was coined by Conrad Waddington in 1948, when he was talking of this, without knowing what is genetics, what is epigenetics, but his concept was genome, epigenome, and phenome. And adipocytes differentiate from the, like, say, mesenchymal stromal cells into pre-adipocytes and adipocytes under the regulation of number of different transfer, I mean, uh, transformation factors and hormones. And that happens between 14 and 22 weeks of gestation. So that is the window when the fat is developing. We have a series of molecular studies which will now come out. We have shown differential epigenetic DNA methylation changes in the cord blood of the babies, which reflect in increased adiposity in the baby, not only at birth, but during subsequent life, childhood and puberty. We have now transcriptome studies in the cord blood partly actually analyzed by symbiosis, Dr. Satyajit here, which showed that micronutrients, which we found to be associated with increased adiposity, are affecting the cell cycle dynamics and the G2M phase transition. We have recently now started studying placental transporters, which actually transfer the nutrition to the baby and we think differential affection of macronutrient and micronutrient transporters are responsible for baby's phenotype. And now we have also gone into adipocyte-derived exosomes. And we have recently now, it's almost in preparation, 127 mother-baby dyads, where we have studied maternal adipocyte-derived exosomes and cord blood exosomes and found there is a strong association between maternal adipocyte-derived exosomes and adiposity in the baby through complex pathways, which are all related to adipogenetic signaling. Complex statement, complex, this figure is called Sankey figure, but we are quite excited about this because we have spent last three and a half years doing this. So finally, what does all this do? So I think in one thing you know that severe undernutrition in utero, where India is the undoubted capital of the world, reflects in subsequent epidemics of diabetes and in other non-communicable diseases. And in the Pune Maternal Nutrition Study, I can now draw this figure about lean mass versus fat mass interaction in producing pre-diabetes at 18 years of age. And boys who had a lower lean mass and higher fat mass have the highest prevalence of pre-diabetes. So this is actually my disclaimer. And that's what Voltaire said. When I said something new, they said it's not true. 
There was a lot of resistance to this idea. And when they realized it is true, they said, now it's not new. Because they had been listening to this for a long time. But I'm quite impressed that this ABCD has come. I didn't know about it. And that's what we had been pushing for 30 years. And I'm sure there is no mention of Indian studies anywhere there. So this is the Voltaire's point. Now again, this is something quite interesting. This is the last slide. This is Vishnu Sahasranam. Some of them, some of you might be actually religious. And Vishnu was described as Anur Bruha. So that means he's small like an atom and big like a sky. And Krusha Sthulo. That is exactly thin fat. Krusha is thin and Sthulo is fat. So nothing is new in science. This was written probably thousands of years ago. Thank you.